Chapter 6 Review Bone Tissue There is a significant amount of physiology in this chapter, starting with molecules such as the calcium phosphate salts and collagen fibers. There are a number of different cell types that you should familiarize yourself with, each of which has a specific job related to a number of different processes in bone physiology. And of course, don't forget to review the various hormones that we discussed in class and how they relate to bone tissue health. Flat bones develop by intramembranous ossification, while the long bones by endochondral ossification. Starting with the cartilage model in endochondral ossification, the first step is a change in the cartilage tissue that allows blood vessels to migrate into the cartilage. Osteoblasts will move in and start replacing some of the cartilage with bone tissue at a location that is called the primary ossification center. Next, a pair of secondary ossification centers are formed when blood vessels grow into the epiphyses, and bone tissue replaces the cartilage tissue here. Most of the cartilage is replaced except at the articular surfaces and the epiphyseal plates. The cartilage will continue to grow in the epiphyseal plate region and get replaced with bone tissue, thus leading to the lengthening of the long bones up until puberty, at which time the cartilage is fully replaced by compact bone tissue. Remodeling will occur and compact bone will be placed in the outer regions of the bone and the inner regions will be replaced with spongy bone or even hollowed out completely. The steps of intramembranous ossification are pretty much the same, although a connective tissue model is used rather than a cartilage tissue model. The steps of bone fracture repair are very similar to the repair of the skin that we learned about in Chapter 5. In skin injuries, first inflammation and hemostasis will lead to the formation of a blood clot. And the same thing happens in bone tissue repair, only an internal clot is called a hematoma. In both tissues, the clot recruits mesenchymal stem cells into the area. In skin, they differentiate into fibroblasts and lay down scar tissue, whereas in bone tissue, the stem cells differentiate into chondroblasts and lay down fibrocartilage, or a soft callus. More mesenchymal stem cells will migrate into the area, differentiate into osteoblasts, and replace the cartilage with bone tissue, or a hard callus. Next up, in both skin and bone, we have a remodeling phase. In skin, scar tissue is replaced with epithelial tissue and connective tissue, while in bone, we modify the bone tissue so that it's compact bone on the outside and spongy bone on the inside. Because osteoblasts require a cartilage model before they can make bone tissue, we had this extra step in bone repair that was different from skin repair, namely soft callus formation. There were a number of hormones that affected bone physiology directly or indirectly. Calcitonin and PTH are mirror hormones. When blood calcium is too low, PTH is secreted. It can activate osteoclasts. It also activates calcitriol, which tells the gut to absorb more calcium. And the kidneys are inhibited from excreting calcium. This should raise blood calcium to the normal level. If it goes too high, then calcitonin would be released. It activates osteoblasts, as well as inhibiting absorption of calcium from the gut and increasing calcium excretion from the kidneys. The osteoblasts would take some of that excess blood calcium and dump it into bone tissue. Be aware that calcitriol's only job is to increase calcium absorption from the gut. It has no idea where that calcium is going to go. If blood calcium was too low and PTH was in the bloodstream, the extra calcium that was absorbed would just go into the blood. 
Whereas if that raised calcium levels too high, then calcitonin would direct that excess calcium to be deposited into bone tissue and increasing bone density. Growth hormone was the primary hormone regulating the growth of bones. Whereas estrogen and testosterone could help with that, as could thyroid hormone. Excessive production of growth hormone prior to puberty can lead to increased growth of all body organs, including the long bones, because they still contain the epiphyseal plates. However, after puberty, when the epiphyseal plates have been replaced with the epiphyseal lines, the long bones cannot grow longer. Instead, they are only able to grow thicker by appositional growth, leading to the condition acromegaly. Compact bone is laid down one layer at a time in a repeating structure called the osteon. The osteocytes live in between layers and are connected to each other via canaliculi and ultimately to the central canal where there is blood supply and nerve tissue as well. Spongy bone on the other hand also has layers but they are not concentric layers. The trabeculae of spongy bone are just a few layers thick. It's because of the vast amount of surface area that spongy bone is more susceptible to the ravages of osteoporosis. There is a lot more turnover in spongy bone as the remodeling units work, osteoblasts laying down tissue that had previously been removed by osteoclasts. Anything that tends to slow down osteoblasts will affect spongy bone more so than compact. And therefore, osteoporosis affects bones that have a lot of spongy bone in them, such as the femur, the mandible, and the vertebrae.